Good evening and welcome. Glad you all could be here this evening. Let's go ahead and get started on a dreary, damp, chilly evening. Uh, if you would have your Bibles, we're going to be jumping around a lot this evening. Uh, we'll begin in uh, Romans 8, 29. Romans 8, 29 this evening. Uh, we've been dealing uh, quite a bit. Uh, we started back when we were able to get back to church from everything related to COVID. Uh, we've been dealing uh, with social justice and, and what are the biblical ways of looking at that. And, uh, we've had to turn our focus to understand that better in the image of God. Uh, we've said that sin has created uh, issues with the image of God, has marred it, has defaced it, uh, uh, any other number, number of words you can use there. And so uh, as we go through this, we decided to take, because of sin, deal with the topic of sin. Uh, we need a Savior. We dealt with Jesus Christ, our high priest, and the atonement, all that gets, and all that we dealt with over the last several weeks. So we've got to bring this back around and deal with the image of God after salvation. So before salvation, every man is created in the image of God. After salvation, we are created as a new creature. And so humanity's renewal, according to God's image in Christ, accomplishes what God had in, originally intended for Adam in the Garden of Eden. Uh, Adam was created perfect. He was without sin, was he not? And so what now is happening through Christ now is what God had originally intended for Adam and Eve. But there is much more involved than just looking back to Adam. Now we as Christians look back to Adam, but now we look back to Christ. Because Christ is the better Adam. God's image is forward-looking by its very nature. When I mean, you think about it, we, we get saved, and our sanctification is an ongoing process, is it not? We are not truly uh, sanctified, so to speak, until we enter into the realms of glory, correct? Then we're considered glorified. So the sanctification process is an ongoing process. Hopefully you are closer to what God would have you be now than you were when you first got saved. Right? I mean, that's the whole point of becoming a new creature, the whole point of getting saved is God working in you uh, through the means of grace, uh, whether it's a Bible study, or whether it's a uh, church, whether it's discipleship, all of these other avenues, prayer, scripture memorization, all these different avenues we have as a means of grace in our lives. He uses those means of grace uh, to work in our lives to make us more like Christ. So God's image is forward-looking by its very nature. God's purpose now involves much more for humanity than what was considered in the Garden of Eden. Think about it, Romans 8, 29. For whom he did foreknow, he also did predestinate to be conformed to the image of his Son. That he might be the firstborn among many brethren. But Christ is conforming you to the image of his Son. Not so much to the image of Adam, but to the image of his Son. Part of the backdrop of Romans 8 is Romans 5, is it not? Where Paul does not merely explain a parallel between Adam and Eve, or between Adam and Christ. He, in, in effect, insists that there is a parallel between Christ and Adam. Now remember back to Romans chapter 5, if you would turn a couple pages in your Bible there, Romans 5, 15. We'll look at verses 16 and 17 as well. And Paul is insisting that Christ, there is a parallel between Adam and Christ, and that Christ is the better Adam. Verse 15 of chapter 5, But not as the offense, so also is the free gift. For if through the offense of one many be dead, meaning Adam, for the offense, Adam sinned, so because of Adam's sin, many are dead. Much more the grace of God and the gift by grace, which is by one man, Jesus Christ. So God's grace in our life is that, Jesus, that God sent his son, Jesus Christ. 
hath abounded unto many, and not as it was by one that sinned, so it is the gift, for the judgment was by one to condemnation. So Adam was judged, everybody was sent to condemnation. But the free gift is of many offenses unto justification. For if by one man's offense death reigned by one, much more they which received abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one, Jesus Christ. Even before Adam sinned, he did not have the same lasting righteousness that a regenerated, justified Christian has. So in some sense, we're actually better off now than Adam was. In Christ, the old Adam, the old man, which we were when before our salvation, was, is not being made better. God in salvation creates a new human, human a, a new creature, right? Paul says that repeatedly throughout the Old Testament. That there's a new creature being made. Humanity is created for a much different purpose, a much better renewal. Now, when you think about Paul writing to the Colossians in Colossians chapter 3, verses 9 and 10. Lie not one to another, seeing that ye have put off the old man with his deeds, and have put on the new man, which is renewed in knowledge after the image of him that created him. Paul deals with this to the church at Corinth in 2 Corinthians chapters 3 and 4. And having those images there in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 and 4, he comes to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. And he says in verse 17, Therefore, if any man be in Christ, he's what? A new creature. A new creature. Old things are passed away. Behold, all things become new. new. So Paul says it differently and back in Romans chapter 6, verse 4 through 6, where we are crucified with Christ. Therefore, we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified with him, that the body of sin might be destroyed, that henceforth, henceforth we should not serve sin. Before Adam and Eve sinned, we as Christians, let's back up a minute, we as Christians progress in our Christianity. We progress in our righteousness. We progress in, in a sanctification. Before Adam and Eve sinned, they were just simply they were just simply righteous. They were innocent. They still needed some sort of spiritual body, which Christ received after his resurrection. <coughs> Like that which we would find in 1 Corinthians chapter 15. And the kingdom of people with resurrected bodies or new creatures was not something that happened because of the fall. This was the plan prior to the fall. This was the plan before Adam and Eve sinned. The plan was for everybody to get a new body. This, the plan was for everybody to get a spiritual body. The plan was to be confirmed in righteousness, to have an ongoing process of sanctification. That was the plan even before Adam and Eve fell. Jesus says in Matthew chapter 40, uh, 25, 34, Then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, and inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. So think about your salvation. We're kind of looking at the image of God, what sin has done, what Christ has done because of sin, what Christ is doing now in us. And what Christ is doing is now, once we are saved, it's a partly a return to what Adam and Eve had, but it's actually something much more as well. When we think of the image of God, 
our thought processes lends us to we need to be like God, right? Right. We we need to be like God. Now, how do we be like God? Uh, we see various attributes, right, in, in the Old Testament that show us that He's merciful, that He's just, that He's righteous, that He's holy, that He's merciful, that He's good, that He's beauty. There are some that we see his that he has dominion over everything. He's sovereign over the entire world. Sovereign over creation. Sovereign over the universe. So, sovereign over time. We see him also in different relationships. Right? Whether it's a, a relationship with the other members of the triune Godhead. Whether it's the relationship between God and the nation of Israel. Whether it's the relationship between God... And the enemies of the nation of Israel. We see these things happen. Is the point that humanity before our salvation, are none of those attributes present in humanity prior to salvation? Can we see these different points in a human being? It may not be all of them, but can we see these different attributes in a human being before salvation? We, we probably know of people that are good, comparatively speaking, that are maybe even good more so than a Christian. Well, we may know some people that are kind more than a Christian. We may know that people have better relationships. They, they do these things better. But what happens to these attributes in humanity? What, what happens to... The reasoning process, what happens to the, the thought processes, what happens to our affections, what happens to uh, any number, our dreams, the, our physical bodies, what happens to all of this after Adam and Eve fell? The sin has marred it to a point where we see glimmers of it, but it's not quite what it should be. Right? Sin has badly stunted these attributes in a person's life. And because sin so uh, changes things and messes things up and makes things much more complex, the attributes that unsaved people have and even safe people uh, unsaved people have, humanity in general has, tends to glorify whom? Themselves. Themselves. What, what was the whole point of us being created? To glorify God. The, the chief end of man is to glorify God and enjoy Him forever. But sin enters the picture and everything that we do even now, as Christians, we struggle with the fact that we want to glorify ourselves. We want to be heard to say that you did a good job. But if you think back to the Sermon on the Mount, which we preached through Matthew chapter 5, verse 16, what, what are the good works supposed to do? Glorify God. Glorify your Father which is in heaven. So let your light so shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father which is in heaven. In Paul, in Romans 8, we, we were there when we first started in verse 29, but in Romans 8, if you back up to verse number 5 in Romans chapter 8, Paul is telling us there's two different groups of people. There are those people that do things after the flesh, and there are those that do things after the spirit. In verse number 5, for they that are after the flesh do mind the things of the flesh, but they that are after the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. Both groups, both groups of humanity, those who follow after flesh and those who follow after the Spirit, have some sort of reason, some sort of moral compass within them that follows what they think is right. They, they manage their lives to some extent. 
Uh, we could even broaden this out and say that to some extent, human humanity uh, has dominion over the environment to some extent based on whether they're living after the flesh or living after the spirit. You go from verse 5, Paul is giving us two different groups of people, those that live after the flesh and those that live after the spirit. You jump to verse 7 and 8. Because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can be. And then what does he say interesting in verse 8? They can't please God. Those who go after the flesh, those who reason after the flesh, those who maintain relationships after the flesh, those who are reasoning because of the flesh and whatever they do, and basically unsaved humanity, cannot what? Cannot please God. So, Adam and Eve fell, sin hit humanity. We looked at what sin is and what sin does. We see what Christ, the our high priest, and what he has done for us because he's taking our sin and making it his own. So there's a fundamental need for people to be, have what? To be a new creature. Mm -hmm. Right? It's almost like saying there's a fundamental need for people to have a, a new humanity. To, to break free from the power of sin. If we are to act like God, if we are to glorify God, if we are to, to be God's children, we have to be put in a place that allows us to do that. And the only place that allows us to do that is in Christ. When we are died with Christ on the cross, and we are raised with Christ at his resurrection, Romans 6. There is something fundamentally different between a Christian and an unbeliever. And it has nothing to do with us. But it's only God's grace in our lives that changes us. We are, we are to reflect God's attributes. We are to reflect uh, who he is in this world. And we can look to the Old Testament and we can see these different attributes uh, appear. But the best pattern, the best example that we have in Scripture is Jesus Christ himself who took on human flesh and worked these things out for us. Because he knows what it's like to live and live perfectly in a sin-cursed world. But there have always been these hints of godly attributes throughout Scripture, even in the Old Testament, that show us what, in a sense, humanity can be. I mean, you think about the wisdom of Solomon. The first Kings 10, 23 through 24. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth for riches and for wisdom, and all the earth saw Solomon to hear his wisdom which God had put in his heart. We have this extraordinary man who is the wisest king of all the earth. We take a different attribute. Take the righteousness. We see the righteousness of Daniel. You remember they threw Daniel in the lion's den. They waited three days and they expected to open it up and like, find him dead. But what does Daniel say when they opened up the cover? My God hath sent his angel and hath shut the lion's mouth, but they have not hurt me. For as much as before him, innocency was found in me. Righteousness, the same word just translated righteousness, is found in me. And also before thee, O king, have I done no hurt. Well, when you think about David's relationship with God, I mean, you can look at various psalms throughout the Psalter and look at David's uh, magnificent relationship between him and God. 
But you see in Acts, the testimony that the New Testament bears of David, in Acts 13, 22, And when he had removed him, he raised up unto them David to be their king, to whom also he gave testimony and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart, which shall fulfill all my will. When you think about Josiah the king, in 2 Kings 23, 25, the only man in Scripture, the only man or woman in Scripture that has this said about him. And like unto him, there was no king before him that turned to the Lord with all his heart, with all his soul, and with all his might, according to all the law of Moses. Neither after him arose there any like him. You think about that. Of all the people that went before Josiah and after Josiah, not one person has been said that he was the one who followed after the Lord with all of his heart, with all of his might, and with all of his soul. You can think about the excellencies of the different women in scriptures like Ruth and like Esther. But like all of these good gifts and all of these different individuals, whether it's uh, Daniel's righteousness or David's relationship with God or Solomon's wisdom or Josiah's reign or the excellencies of Esther and Ruth, we know, as James says, that every good gift and every perfect gift is from above. And cometh down from the Father of life, with whom is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. The amazing thing is, is those things came from God, and it was God's intention for the image of God to act in these ways. That the way out of being constricted by sin is a way out of dealing with a sin-cursed body is Jesus Christ. This repeatedly comes back to Jesus Christ. The only difference between humanity and sin and humanity that has been saved is Jesus Christ. And we'll look at these four illustrations of this with Jesus Christ next week, but we'll mention them this, this week. Now, the four attributes most often associated with the image of God actually provide us illustrations of how God renews the Christian. We'll see uh, reason. We'll see wisdom. I mean, we'll see reason, righteousness, and I think we will see also relationship. And I don't have the fourth one, but those are the three of the four that we'll look at next week. Now, thank you for joining us by way of Facebook.